and continue a series of ser ser sermons on the power of the Holy Spirit. And you may think that's an unusual chapter to go to, but I want to read one verse, chapter uh, 5, verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You ever see somebody that words are cheap? They tell you, you know, they love you, but boy, when it comes right down to it, you know, I don't know if you ever heard the old, the old famous old comedian years ago, old Jerry Clower. He was an old famous southern comedian and always very spiritual, very clean. He was on the Grand Ole Opera probably 30, 40 years and traveled. He was called the uh, Mouth of the South, Yazoo, Mississippi. You ever, anybody ever heard of Jerry Clower other than me, maybe? <clears throat> okay, got a few. And he tells a true story, he claimed, I guess. I don't know if his stories were true or a little embellished or a little both, that him and his little cousin, Marcel Ledbetter, was five years old. And Marcel, you know, and they lived in the Azu, Mississippi. And, and a lot of people don't know, but uh, Jerry Clark played college football for uh, Mississippi State. And, of course, was in the military service for years and so forth, served their country. But he tells that they were sitting there, and they were five-year-old boys. And they're sitting on a front po porch of an old country store. Has anybody ever done that? Where I grew up in the mountains of Tennessee, there was a little store right down below our house, and we would actually walk down the road, pick up pop bottles. Because if you could pick pop bottles up and clean them up a little bit, they gave you, I believe it was one or two cents per pop bottle, and we'd bring a whole, you know, garbage can full or whatever we could carry in our arms, me and my brother and my cousin, and we'd go down to the country store, and we'd trade them in and usually get an RC Cola, and a moon pie. <laughs> That's biblical in the South. You've got to do it that way. You can't do it the other way, opposite. But uh, we would sit on the front porch of that old store and watch people go by. You know, people today don't take a lot of time. They just sort of hurry, hurry, and run in and run out. They don't, you know, you don't even know who your neighbors are. Let's tell the truth. If I really, truly did a survey of probably you good folks, and you're the best of the best, you probably really don't know your neighbors that very well. Probably wouldn't know all their names. Maybe not even where they're from. But you see, the old timey days, we took time to sit and talk to one another and find out about each other and spend time. Well, him and Jerry are sitting on the front porch. They're five-year-old boys. And they're sharing an RC Cola and a moon pie. And all of a sudden, Marcel Ledbetter said to Jerry Clary, he said, Jerry, do you love me? And they were first cousins. And, of course, Jerry said, Why, of course I love you. You're my first cousin. You're just like a brother. I love you. I'd fight for you. And old Marcel said, Well, Jerry, if you had a million dollars, would you give me half of one? And he said, Why, of course I'd give you a half a million dollars. I told you, we're kinfolk. I'd be glad to share it with you. And all of a sudden he said, Marcel looked at him and said, Well, Jerry... Would you give me one of your little pigs? And Jerry said, now that ain't fair. I got two pigs and you know that. <laughs> now that's the way it is a lot of times people in life, you see. It's easy to give something away that you don't have. And that's true for life, isn't it, you know? People are bad about that. They'll, they'll tell you all the time, you know, do this and do that. But then if you look at their lives, you would wonder. Now as we go into this study, as I preached last week, I believe that, that there is a power that only comes from God. I believe it comes through the Holy Spirit, and I believe that it can do all things. I believe it was manifested in the book of Acts. It was poured out on all the, the flesh there. Eighteen nations were gathered there, and when Peter began to preach that wonderful sermon, all eighteen nations heard in their own language. It was a marvel. It was incredible. How could this defeat have happened? And, of course, Peter preaches to them the very first gospel sermon after the death of of Jesus. And of course, as we go on through the New Testament, the Holy Spirit was evident everywhere in the New Testament. 
And I'm afraid that so many times we don't really either A, understand what the Holy Spirit is, and B, we're maybe even quenching the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's why I want to talk to you today what Paul said here. He said, if we live in the Spirit, then we should also what? Walk in the Spirit. In other words, let your actions speak louder than your words. You know, nothing's more worse than a, than a, a forked tongue person. <laughs> you know, that says one thing, then you live and look how they live another way. And you're like, wow. So Paul warned the early church here that they should walk in the Spirit. The first thing I noticed about when you walk in the Spirit, and even the apostles, even before the day of Pentecost, number one, they acknowledged who God in Christ was. They not only said, I believe in God, they were willing to die for Him at this time. They had seen Him raised from the grave. They had seen a power like no other human being had ever seen. They watched him ascend to the heavens, heard the angels speak to them and said, as you see him leave, one day you will see him return. And folks, he promised that he would give them something that would carry on. He called it a comforter. Do you know the Holy Spirit sometimes is called a comforter? And if you are not a believer, that's probably why you're not comforted at times. But I think the first thing you need to do is to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is not only Lord, but to acknowledge this Spirit is alive in you. Now let me tell you why that's important. That's exactly what it is like when you are married. You know when a person usually gets married, usually they give an exchange of rings. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's usually a token of your affection. Usually the girl's ring costs more than the guy's ring, but that's how it marriage is supposed to be, you see, you know, it's a give and take, and we give and they take, but that's side the point, it's all good, it's all good, I'm getting ready to go on vacation with mine, so now I ain't going to mess up here now, I promise you, but you know, that ring is a symbol of your devotion to each other, but listen, so is the Holy Spirit in your life. You see, when you are a believer of Christ, when you have accepted the Lord, when you have confessed Him and repented and been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, then you are indwelling God's presence in your heart and your life. And it's just like in a marriage. You can break those vows real quick, can't you? Years ago, sadly, when I used to do my old drinking days and I'd go to the bars, I'd see a lot of married men and people have asked me through the years, why don't you wear a wedding band? I don't. I just don't. There's nothing wrong with it. If you want to wear one, I praise the Lord. I can't wear them because my hands are so broke up, and I have one, and if I put it on, it swells so bad, it takes a day or two to cut it off, and all that stuff. But you know what? You know one of the reasons why I don't do it? Because when I sadly used to do my drinking days, I'd see a lot of young men that I knew that were married and before they'd walk in that bar, guess what they would do? You see, that token meant nothing to them, did it? To me, my vows meant something 30 years ago when I stood before God Almighty and stood before the church and before my wife and my family and I promised to love and to keep and to cherish my wife and to be there through sickness and health till death do us part. That meant something to us. It's the same thing of acknowledging the Holy Spirit in your life. Every day you need to say, you know, I've got God's presence in my life. Now how am I going to live? And I'll promise you the devil will challenge that, won't he? Something will happen that you'll be sitting there saying, boy, I'm, I'm just going to think of a bad thought right now. Somebody's made me mad. Maybe it's a co-worker that will jump on you. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it'll be paying a, a tithe versus a bill. Maybe it's a stress of life. And, all of a sudden, you're in this battle whether you will acknowledge the Lord and His presence in your life or you'll sort of put it off and stick it in your back pocket till you get over your mad spell. You know, a lot of people do that, don't they? You know, they, they really do that. They let this world get to them. And one of the things I noticed about the early church, they constantly was acknowledging 
not only who God was, who Christ was, that he was the risen Savior, but folks, listen, they did not ever denounce their faith in Christ. Of all these men that became apostles that were chosen by Christ himself, as far as we know, they all died a horrible death, did they not? They were not going to deny the Lord. It was like God blessed them men again just over days, other days over in seas where they would not deny Christ. And sadly, they lost their life. Again, we see this happening more and more in our society. But these men were, I believe, filled with the presence of God. And they were not going to allow themselves to ever, to, not to disacknowledge. They acknowledged him even as they were taking their life. They acknowledged. Why? Because they love Christ. His name was Bill, and I cannot pronounce his last name to say it right, but I think it's something like Zenus. He is not given any credit, but yet he takes one of the most valuable films, actual colored films, of the battle of World War II and Iwo Jima. He himself is videoing and taping. He's a war correspondent as they raise the flag. You remember the famous Marine symbol on the second time they raised it? And yet Rothenball, I believe this guy who took the picture, he becomes famous and is celebrated all over the world as one of the greatest photographers. But Bill received nothing. Matter of fact, nine days later, he was killed in action and never got any credit Film. You know what's the ironic part about his life? If you look up his story, he had been wounded by about four or five months prior at another battle in another island. You see, these men were just not war correspondents. Sadly, he had to pick up his gun, and it was known he had nine kills to his name as he killed the Japanese as they surrounded him, and the other men got up and ran, and he sat in a foxhole and began to fight for his life. When the, finally the Americans take back over that little island of the Marshall Islands, he stands up and they accidentally think he's an enemy and shoot him in the leg. He goes back to Hawaii and there he recuperates for over four months. He is immediately told by his commanders, you now can go home to your wife in Minnesota. He was above Minneapolis. You have paid your due to society, to, the, to our service, and you can go home. And yet Bill said, I want to go back to my men. Now, you know what that is called? That's called acknowledgement. He was proud to be a soldier of the United States. He believed in the cause of what they were fighting for against the tyrannies of the world, and he was willing to lose his life. When's the last time you acknowledged that you were even a Christian? I can't do this because I'm a Christian. I can't be unfaithful to my wife because I'm a Christian. I can't... Use the filthy words and the language that I used to use. Why? Because I'm a Christian. I can't let my anger get the best of me and my temper overcome me. Why? Because I have got the Holy Spirit in my life and I don't want to quench that. You see, by acknowledging Christ and the Holy Spirit every day, listen to me. Folks, it'll guide you. And when that old devil comes and that temptation hits you, and I promise you it will... You can sit there and say, I'm not going to turn my back against God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. So the first thing I noticed by Paul, as well as these earlier Christians, they acknowledged the Spirit of God in their life every day. And then number two, I noticed they prayed. Didn't the Bible say that they went to the upper room and there God had told them or Christ had told them to wait? And they sit there for days after days after days most people today, honest to goodness, if we go past 9.30, they're looking at their watch. You know. And you know, the sad part is, maybe that's why they are so empty with the Spirit of God. Jesus said, pray without ceasing. That means pray 24-7, constantly. You see, Christ was with the Spirit, and He was with the Holy Spirit, and they were constantly communing together it's just like again a marriage it's just like with a parenting 
You may say, well, I don't know my kids. And the first thing I've learned to say through the years, or my stepchildren, you know what I've learned to say? How much time do you really spend with those children? I'm getting ready to leave and go on vacation that I haven't had in eight years. And, and, and I really don't want to go to the place I'm going to go but I'll be honest with you, I'm going to go because I want to spend time with my children. It's my last shot to be with my son for three years. And I want to spend time with that young man. I want to be talking to him again and, and minister to him because I'm not just his father, I'm also his example of Christ in life. And I want to be the best. I want to spend time with my grandson and enjoy him and talk to him about the Lord and we'll talk about we're going to have Bible studies and they just don't always know that but we're going to you know we're going to we're going to get we're, we might even save Mickey Mouse down there you never know <laughs> but prayer how often do you pray no wonder the spirit of God is dead in so many Christians today and it doesn't it doesn't have to be that that's not what God intended it to be. He said you will be filled with a great power. But you say, well, I feel powerless. Why don't you pray? Why don't you pray and say, Lord, fill me with your presence. Fill me with your spirit. Let that spirit fall upon me. You know, it's like witnessing to people. You say, well, I know people need Jesus. I know they need to accept Christ. Well, why don't you talk to them? Well, I don't know what to say. Why don't you pray about it? Say, Lord, help me to speak. You would be surprised what the Spirit of God could do to your life if you just take a moment to pray. I think I've shared this. I know I have a thousand times with you. But even the Old Testament Jewish people had taught their children to pray. And they taught that when they prayed to God, that heaven came down and the earth came up and together they kissed. It was a coming together. It was an intimacy that was precious. And that's what happens, folks, when you pray. Listen to me. God can change anything through prayer. It is the power unlimited to any believer in the world. And it's the same power that I've got that you've got. For I, the Lord God, is no respecter of persons. Which means he's not going to give the Danny Banks because I'm a preacher something more than he won't give Jack. It's the same power. It's available everywhere. If you would just pray and pray and pray and pray, you would be surprised what obstacles would start falling in your own life. If you just take some time to turn the television off, turn the radio off, unless you're listening to a good gospel song or a message or a good gospel show on TV. But even then, sometimes you need to turn it off and talk to the Father and pray. The early church prayed for days and days and days. And you know, we know they were in their upper room for over 10 days but did you know what? I believe they'd have stayed there a hundred days, maybe a thousand days. Oh, they may have lost some of them. It always happens that way. You start a new work in a new church and people get excited and they all start running there and churches start filling up. But you know, you watch. And slowly but surely, it's just like a, a gradual bit. Don't let that happen to you. The devil is constantly working on us. And I think the only way I know to stop him is to pray. Number three, they trusted the Lord. They trusted the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you why I think we don't trust Jesus today. Are you listening to me? And why we don't trust the Holy Spirit in God? Because we have been let down by humans that we trust. We immolate people. We put faith in people. And we trust in somebody. Everybody in this room, if you've had any time on this earth, can raise your hand and testify that I'm telling you right. Somebody's let you down in life, haven't they? Somebody's disappointed you. Somebody didn't fulfill their obligation. They didn't stick in there with you through thick and thin. 
And it's a disappointing time, isn't it? You know, Jesus knew this. He felt this. He knew how people was. One minute they loved him. Seven days before they crucified Jesus, they gave him a parade. And seven days later, that same crowd was crying, crucify him. Do you think that didn't hurt Jesus? He was still human. And he felt this. He felt discouraged. He felt down because he felt people break the trust. But you see, he kept to his task. Listen to me this morning. If you are going to truly have the presence of God and the Spirit of God in your life, you've got to learn to trust the Lord. Completely. But as long as you give him just a little bit of your trust, <laughs> you know, people are bad about that because, again, they've been hurt. You know, it's like giving a little bit of your heart. Well, I'm not going to give you all my heart. Why? Well, because I've had my heart broken. But I want to tell you what I found about Jesus and what I find about the Bible and what I find about studying the Scriptures and my walk, even my own walk. Listen, Jesus has never let me down. But I have let him down many times. I disappoint myself sometimes. But Jesus has never let me down. He has never forsaken me. In my worst times or in my best times, he is faithful. Right there. When everybody else leaves you, you're laying in that old hospital bed, sick, or hurting. I'm thinking this morning as I come around the corner to walk into the church after you all were taking the Lord's Supper, I was thinking of Steve Ditchfield. Again, this is his second Sunday he's not here. And the men went to visit him. He's laying down there in bad shape with cancer. Don't you tell me the devil isn't working on him. He can work on you hard when you're physically sick. And it don't look like you're going to get any better. But I want you to learn to fully trust the Lord. That's the only way I found that Christ can really do the great miracles even in your life. Is when you fully say, I'm going to give him all my heart. You know, we say, well, I accepted Christ. I was baptized. I'd, but did you give him all your heart? you hold back a little bit. Listen to me. It's just like with your job and your career. You know, companies are getting bought out. People have been buying and selling. And, 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 you know, if you work for these companies, you know what the first thing you think of? Well, am I going to have a job? Are they going to eventually lay me off? Are they going to just get rid of my position? Because a lot of times that's what big companies do, don't they? And you know, it's so hard to trust. But let me tell you, once again, Jesus, if you trust him, not just as a savior, but as a comforter, as a friend, listen, he's, he is according to the Bible, he is like uh, the, my father. When I hear bad news, when I hear troubled times, when I see bad situations, I just start talking to him and say, Lord, you've got to help me or help this situation. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how you are. I get a peace in my heart. And even though the situation may not be resolved, there's a peace in my heart. So I want you to learn to start trusting the Lord more. Trust Him with your tithes. He will not forsake you on that, folks. He will not let you down. He promised that. Trust Him with your faith. And the world may let you down, but Jesus will be there with you right into the very end, and He'll even send the angels to carry you to heaven. Listen, when those boys lost their life last week or 10 days ago, and though sadly that terrible group of Taliban was killing them and ISIS, I don't know about you, but I got a vision that I sit there and said to myself, I could just see the angels of God coming down to those young men and picking them off that beach and carrying them into heaven. We forget. This world has never intended to be your final home. You're just passing through. I went home to see my father this week and spend a few days. And I always go up to my family cemetery, and work on it and clean. And there's my mother's grave. There's my grandparents' grave, my Aunt Bobby and others that have passed on. And you know, I, I just, anymore, I just can't get sad. 
Now, first I did. Because you know why I can't get sad? It's the same reason why you can't. If you know where your family is. First of all, you know they're not in that grave. Them old bones are in there and them old clothes. But they're not there. But you see, I believe what the Scripture says, to be absent in the body is to be present with my Lord. And I know how happy they are. I know how joyful they are. I know what, it's unbelievable joy. And you know, folks, I've learned to trust in the Lord in that. Then, then also I want you to act upon it. Fourthly, they acted upon it. Again, you can talk about it, but they got up and did something. When the Spirit fell upon Peter, he got up and began to preach. Remember, these are the same people that crucified Jesus that he was preaching, many of them, which meant they had the power to kill him. What caused him to be bold? The Spirit of God. What would cause you to be bold in high school? The Spirit of God. What caused you to be bold in your life? As I was coming down a little country road right below where I grew up, I come around the curve, and I mean, these are little rural areas, way up in the mountains. The last thing you would think you would see is a Tennessee Highway Patrol. And as I come around the corner, he was standing there at the old railroad tracks right above my, the old elementary school I went to called Happy Valley. And he sort of threw his hand up like this, and I threw my brakes on right quick, and I thought, what in the world? You know, what in the world is he doing out on this rural little country road? And I slowed down and stopped, and he just sort of motioned me on, you know, and I started going, and all of a sudden it hit me. I said, yeah, he looks familiar. So I just stopped in the middle of the road. Folks, this is East Tennessee. This is what you do. And I jumped out. I said, you ain't Steve Smith, are you? Or Steve Street? He laughs and, no, no, he's a captain. I said, well, who are you? And I looked at him, and he said, well, come over here. And I just left my truck running in the middle of the road. I got out and walked right over to him. He looked at me. He said, Danny Banks. I said, Mike Bolt. We played sports together. I said, what in the world? As God is my witness. We, he said, pull over here. I pulled over off the side of the road, and for 35 minutes we talked. He's coming to church here next month. He said, I'll be down here in town, and he said, I want to come to church. Now, but listen to me. Listen to me. I finally even said after 30-some minutes, I sat there and said, aren't you supposed to be working? He said, yeah. <laughs> You know, but what a joy it was of acting on that. You see, I'd have missed that opportunity had I not walked over and talked to him. I want you to learn to start acting. When God says, go speak to somebody, you speak to them. You don't have to go start preaching every sermon and quote every verse in the Bible because you couldn't do it anyway, and I can't either. But you can tell them how much Jesus loves them. You can talk to them, say, how hey, you're having a good day. You can maybe make a smile upon their face. Let's stand.